Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Lyptic Ask Me Anything session on the U.S. Treasury's recent sanctions against Tornado Cash, the DeFi mixing service that the U.S. sanctioned for facilitating transactions on behalf of North Korean cyber criminals. I'm David Carlisle, the Vice President of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Elliptic, and great to be here today answering these questions for you. Now, first question we have today about this action is, what are the legal implications of OFAC sanctioning a DeFi project? Now, when OFAC imposes sanctions on a particular entity, U.S. persons, which includes U.S. citizens and U.S.-based companies like crypto exchanges, can't deal with it, and they have to block property belonging to it. So when something goes on the OFAC list, you have to stop transacting with it or its property. Now, that may seem straightforward, but in the case of Tornado Cash, this poses some really interesting questions and challenges. Now, this is the first time OFAC has ever sanctioned a decentralized finance or DeFi project. And it's interesting because typically when OFAC imposes sanctions, they're on entities such as corporations, charities, or other legal structures. And in this case, Tornado Cash is something a bit unconventional. Uh, on the one hand, it's a project that features developers, governance token holders, a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, transaction relayers, and others who are involved in the activity of what's a more uh, a network of loosely affiliated parties rather than a single coherent structure. Uh, but beneath that, it's also a bunch of code. So what are known as smart contracts or self-executing protocols on the blockchain uh, enable the underlying mix cap mixing capability that users of Tornado Cash rely on to uh, obtain a degree of anonymity. So that's led a lot of people to ask, well, what's actually being sanctioned here? Uh, is this just a case of OFAC sanctioning code uh, rather than actually sanctioning an entity? And it's a complex legal problem, uh, one that raises a lot of interesting questions and has generated a lot of controversy in the crypto space. You know, so for example, some of the questions that arise include things like, well, you know, given the decentralized nature of the underlying protocol, uh, to what extent can it be said that addresses associated with the Tornado Cash protocol or on the OFAC sanctions list are actually owned or controlled by Tornado Cash? Or if the code from Tornado Cash contracts is redeployed to new contracts, should these also be considered sanctions? Uh, another question that comes up is, you know, would that only be the case if the current developers deploy, deploy those smart contracts? What if a separate entity or individuals deploy those contracts? Are those sanctioned? Another question that comes up for compliance teams is, do they need to block all transactions with anyone purporting to operate the Tornado Cash protocol, regardless of whether they are associated with the original developers or the operators of the tornado.cash domain that features on the OFAC list? Now, these are very complex, complex questions, and unfortunately, OFAC hasn't provided targeted guidance to answer them. I think, too, there are a number of issues here that the courts are probably going to need to decide upon. In the meantime, though, if you're a crypto business, an exchange, or other platform with operations in the U.S., you need to treat any transactions or wallets associated with Tornado Cash very, very carefully, or you risk an OFAC violation. Now, the second question we have today, someone asked, is what does this mean for other DeFi product projects? Should they be worried about OFAC sanctions too? Yeah, so that's another really interesting potential outcome of all of this. Now, um, look, I don't think it's the case at all that OFAC is just going to start putting DeFi projects, whether decentralized exchanges or other apps on its sanctions list. Uh, I don't think that's the aim here. Uh, I don't think they're going to do that in, a, in an indiscriminate fashion where anything that's DeFi is going to be targeted by, by OFAC. So, you know, unless your DeFi app is facilitating lots of transactions for North Korea, uh, you know, winding up on the OFAC list imminently probably shouldn't be a concern for you. Well, what I do think most developers, investors, and others involved in DeFi projects are going to be impacted by is around a growing expectation that they need to be undertaking at least some compliance activities to make sure their projects aren't being used by the likes of North Korea. Now, in fact, in its announcement about Tornado Cash, the Treasury called out the fact that Tornado Cash's developers had repeatedly claimed to be ensuring that Tornado Cash wasn't being used for sanctions evasion, but they clearly never they clearly never undertook sufficient steps to ensure that that was the case. And now, there's an, another complex debate here around the question of whether or how DeFi services should be subject to anti-money laundering or sanctions, sanctions regulations, and around the questions of how you even compel a DeFi app to be compliant since it's not always straightforward to identify a single person behind them. Uh, the Financial Action SAS Task Force, which is the global setter, standard setter on all things related to anti-money laundering, has set out an expectation that countries should regulate those who control or influence DeFi apps. Uh, but that's really easily easier said than done. And I think the reaction of some, but certainly not all in the DeFi community, has been to argue that they don't really face a need to comply with regulation. 
you know, the argument being that because their project is decentralized, it can't really be regulated effectively uh, in, in a world where regulation was designed for centralized entities. So there's really not been a lot of proactive compliance on the part of DeFi innovators. Now, my view is that the OFAC action against Tornado Cash will, and it should change that. I think we're going to see an increasing number of DeFi innovators start to think about how they can comply with regulation or how they can build regulatory compliance principles into the design of their DeFi projects. I mean, let's face it, it's really not good for the future of your project if it winds up on the OFAC list or if it's the subject of a fine or a penalty from regulators. And you'll have a very hard time attracting institutional money or investors to get involved in your DeFi project if you can't at least demonstrate that you want to be compliant or, or sensitive to the concerns of regulators. So, you know, setting aside some of the legal complexities around this particular case, I do think we're going to see some DeFi projects writ large coming under increasing pressure from regulators to demonstrate compliance. And I think innovators in this space should think carefully about how this can be an opportunity for them. By which I mean, you know, if you can launch a project that's innovative, but can also avoid run-ins or problems with regulators, well, that's certainly better than how things turned out for Tornado Cash. And the last question we have today, uh, someone asks, does this mean that any time an exchange handles funds with any exposure to Tornado Cash, that it's a violation of the sanctions? And isn't there a danger that blockchain analytics could result in anyone who's touched Tornado Cash being blocked uh, from services almost permanently? So yeah, this is definitely a much more technical compliance question. Um, I, I think one major challenge that arises in a case like this is that Tornado Cash was a very prolific service or platform in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, it was used to process more than $7 billion worth of transactions across the Ethereum and other blockchains. And that means that there are lots and lots of crypto wallets out there that were exposed to Tornado Cash even before the sanctions were imposed, uh, but which may have permanent tainting on the blockchain as a result of those connections. It also means that there are even lots of people out there with wallets that may be tainted through some totally coincidental inadvertent interaction with other wallets that may have once interacted with Tornado Cash. So a big question that comes up among compliance teams is, if we're encountering hundreds or even thousands of cases of wallets or transactions with even inadvertent exposure to Tornado Cash, are we potentially violating the sanctions? Now, um, uh, OFAC, again, hasn't really opined on this specifically, um, but my view really is no. I, I don't think it's the intention of the sanctions to prevent innocent people uh, who maybe transacted with Tornado Cash prior to the sanctions being imposed, or worse, have wallets with exposure to Tornado Cash totally accidentally from being able to access services because of, of some incidental or historical tainting. That's just not the objective of what the sanctions are meant to do. And the sanctions are really more about making it more difficult for this particular service, Tornado Cash, from being available to the likes of North Korea. So I think what regulators are really more concerned about here are failures of crypto exchanges or operators of DeFi interfaces to detect attempts to evade the sanctions by users who are really deliberately continuing to use Tornado Cash despite the sanctions, you know, processing transactions on behalf of those deliberately trying to use Tornado Cash even in the face of these restrictions. Now, um, that isn't always an easy thing to assess on the blockchain, because you might have a case where you encounter a wallet that has $1,000 worth of historical transactions, and 50% of that, or say $500 worth, involve exposure to Tornado Cash. Now, how do you determine if that's a violation? So really, in a case like that, you have to look at a combination of factors. So where a wallet is, say, 50% tainted by Tornado Cash, the risk is likely to be higher than if the wallet just had a level of, say, 1% of exposure through its historical transactions to Tornado Cash. Um, and, but I mean, really, that doesn't tell the whole story either. You might need to look at some additional questions around, say, proximity, or that is, you know, how many hops or intermediate wallets did those funds pass through before reaching that wallet from Tornado Cash? Was the interaction direct, uh, or was it many wallets away? So transactions that come directly from a sanctioned entity are likely to be of most concern, uh, but you also just can't discount more remote connections completely. You know, for example, suppose funds pass from Tornado Cash through 20 hops before reaching a particular wallet. No, you need to understand what's the velocity of that transfer. Did the funds go through 20 hops in two days, in which case that suggests there may be an intentional transfer or an attempted sanctions evasion, or did it occur over the course of two years? So those are all the types of factors that compliance needs to be thinking about. And, and those types of considerations around exposure, proximity, velocity can help you to form the basis of a risk-based approach that avoids you having to indiscriminately ban every user who may have some bit of exposure or tainting 
um, but but really allows you to set out a process that's much more thoughtful and works for you and your business. And importantly, I think OFAC has made clear that it does allow firms to implement a risk-based approach to how they manage sanctions risks. So this is very possible to do. And a lot of the work we do at Elliptic is about providing our customers, crypto exchanges, and financial institutions with the solutions they need and the advice they need to be able to navigate those types of challenges.